thank you all for coming tonight. It's really great to be back at Cory Farm. I was here in 2019, <laughs> um, and it's great to be with all of you. Let me begin also by thanking Joe Lamax, Steve Webb, the Center for Mark Twain Studies, and Elmira College for their wonderful hospitality and support for the work of Mark Twain Scholarship. And I'm grateful to the Cory Farm Fellowship Committee for this opportunity to be here this two weeks. Uh, Joe mentioned the, this is part of a longer project. Uh, I call it The Yankees and Their Kings, Mark Twain and Henry Stanley, from uh, King Arthur to King Leopold. And this is the last piece in a very big puzzle. Samuel Clemens had three explicit reasons for visiting England in the fall of 1872. He sought to cement relations with his British publisher, George Rutledge and Sons, for the authorized UK editions of Roughing It and Innocence Abroad. He wanted to challenge publisher John Camden Hotton who's un for his unauthorized publications of his work. And he aimed to soak up English life in preparation for a new book featuring Mark Twain's comic take on local customs. An unspoken fourth reason was escape from what Joe Cecilia calls Mark Twain's first season in hell, two years of illness and death among family and friends that peaked with the June 2nd death of son Langton. Sam had not intended to connect with Henry Morton Stanley, recently returned from his successful expedition to rescue missionary explorer Dr. David Livingston. But approaching Liverpool on September 1st, Sam dutifully forwarded and endorsed James Redpath's invitation, received just before his ship left New York, offering to manage a U.S. lecture tour for Stanley that winter. Sam's friendship with Stanley that began during this visit not only fills in bio biographical and historical details of a time when both men felt the thrill and challenges of life as Yankees suddenly thrust into Queen Victoria's England, but also tracks Mark Twain's growth as a writer, shifting from topical sketches and travel books to fully developed fictions and a robust public persona. The men's earliest interaction did not bode well for future relations. In his first major assignment as a correspondent for the Missouri Democrat, Stanley covered Mark Twain's March 26, 1867 Sandwich Island Lecture in St. Louis and produced a verbatim transcript that cost Clemens both the copyright on his text and future bookings to perform it. But when they met on equal footing in London five years later, in September 1872, each had won astonishing transatlantic celebrity. Mark Twain for the wild success of Innocence Abroad in 1869, and Stanley for his triumph as a reporter for the New York Herald, whose editor James Gordon Bennett Jr. had sponsored his expedition. Stanley had located the doctor whose communication from Central Africa had ceased in 1867 in Ujiji on the shores of Lake Tanganyika in today's Tanzania on November 10, 1871 and then spent four months with him, nursing the doctor back to health, and then exploring the lake's geography and relation to the Nile together. Stanley began his return to the coast on March 14, 1872, and on May 1st, 29 months after he embarked, he began to file reports via London to much international acclaim for the grand triumph of American enterprise. Observers on both sides of the pond drew nationalist conclusions because the 31-year-old journalist and amateur, amateur bushwhacker traveling under the American flag had bested the professional military team sent by the Royal Geographical Society, the RGS, who left England in February 1872, just before Stanley trudged back to the coast to file his report. Just embarking on the Livingston mission took him on an 11-month journey from Egypt through present-day Israel, Turkey, Crimea, Iraq, Iran, Persia, and India before he sailed from Mumbai to Zanzibar off the coast of Tanzania where he acquired equipment and senior staff. 
Only then did he begin his 700-mile trek through the African jungle. While awaiting Stanley's full account for the Herald, the world press marveled at his Yankee cuteness. Illustrated newspapers glorified his heroism. And there you can see the American flag in this image. Harper's Weekly went further and characterized Stanley as a heroic American frontiersman. Quote, a native of Missouri, raised in the border wilderness, who enjoyed comparatively scant educational advantages. He had, however, the ambition and industry that are our most conspicuous national characteristics. This mythic account, likely planted by Stanley's allies, countered whispers circulating in England and the US that the star journalist for the Herald was actually born illegitimately as John Rowlands in Wales and grew up in St. Asaph's poorhouse there. Rowlands had not become a US citizen after jumping ship in New Orleans in 1859, but he did change his name to suit his new circumstances. As Henry Stanley, he enlisted in the Confederate 6th Arkansas Infantry, fell captive to Grant's forces at Shiloh, escaped Chicago's Camp Douglas prison by enlisting in the 1st Illinois Light Artillery, went AWOL from the Army Hospital, and then left the U.S. for two years of international wandering, including a failed effort to reunite in Wales with his mother. Returning to North America, he joined the U.S. Navy in July 1864, using a new birth date, but then deserted in February. He turned to journalism, the last sort of scoundrels. And there, Stanley transcribed Mark Twain's Sandwich Island lecture as a, for the Missouri Gem Democrat just before the newspaper sent him to embed with the U.S. Army on his eight-month campaign to pacify Western Plains people. As a white man, a Civil War veteran, and a journalist covering U.S. colonial expansion in the Western Plains, Stanley could justifiably consider himself American. These details wouldn't come out for many months, but Mark Twain followed the Stanley Livingston coverage in the summer of 1872 and saw comic potential in it. His widely reprinted July 20th sketch in the Hartford Current, The Secret of Dr. Livingston's Voluntary Exile, drew its epigraph from Stanley's blockbuster July 15th report of his first conversations with Livingston. I had to give him five years news to begin with. From this statement, Mark Twain imagined why the doctor chose not to return to England despite years of, quote, suffering in mind, body, and estate. Livingston had given Stanley a letter explaining his aim to complete his explorations before going home, but Mark Twain knew the real reason for Livingston's voluntary exile. It was the news. You have told me stupendous things, as Livingston says, following Stanley's detailed recap of international developments since 1865. But when you tell me that Horace Greeley has become a Democrat and the Ku Klux swing their hats and whoop for him, I'll be damned to all eternity if I believe it. My trunk is packed to go home, but I shall remain in Africa. For these things may be true after all. If they are, I desire to stay here and unlearn my civilization. <laughs> Published nine years after Clemens adopted Mark Twain as his comic signature, this topical sketch shows how he not only continued to mine current events for humor, as in his Nevada journalism, but also continued to satirize missionary activity as imperialism, as in the lectures Stanley had transcribed before. There, and our fellows of the Sandwich Islands, Mark Twain first satirized mock imperialism as what he would later call the blessings of civilization. He marveled that, quote, educating and civilizing by American missionaries had led the Hawaiian population, quote, to drop off with commendable activity from the original 400,000 to some 55,000, a decline of more than 85%. And he predicted 
that the backwoods natives who, quote, do everything wrong and first would upend U.S. politics, quote, if you take those islands away from these people, as we are pretty sure to do someday. Instead of fostering and encouraging a judicious system of railway speculation and all that sort of thing, he predicted, they will elect the most incorruptible men to Congress. The secret of Dr. Livingston's voluntary exile similarly sympathizes with the indigenous people. Mark Twain's imaginary missionary deflates U.S. self-regard with his blasphemous response to Greeley's endorsement by white supremacists. I'll be damned to all eternity if I believe it. And Livingston's choice, quote, to stay here and unlearn my civilization mocks Western enlightenment and questions who is colonizing whom on the so-called uh, continent. Stanley remained in the news the rest of the summer, his dispatches filling a void as he worked his way back from Africa to England. Early skepticism towards Stanley's <coughs> reports, notably the RGS president Sir Henry Rawlinson's sneer the previous May, that if there had been any discovery and relief, it was Dr. Livingston who had discovered and relieved Mr. Stanley and not the other way around. That had faded in June with independent confirmation of Stanley's success. But new questions arose when his drunk Welsh half-brother and cousin met him in view of the press at his London pier when he arrived in London on August 1st. I never felt so ashamed, he wrote in his journal, and would have given all I was worth to have been back in Central Africa. Their welcome added public shame to the private scorn they gave me as a child. And they revived, with the press termed, the great Welsh question, which impugned his social status as well as his celebrity and his credibility. The controversy peaked on August 16th as Clemen prepares to leave for England when Stanley reported to the RGS on the late Tanganyika survey his formal apprenticeship and exploration with Livingston. When a testy Q&A led to charges that Stanley had presented sensational tales and not geographical science, and that Livingston's research on the Nile sources was faulty, geography president Francis Galton upped the ante asking if Mr. Stanley would be so good as to say whether he was a Welshman. Stanley made the unfortunate choice to insist on his American identity, causing quite a scandal because his mother had already confirmed the rumors. But Queen Victoria soon mooted the issue. She sent him a diamond-studded snuffbox made of gold, a note with Her Majesty's congratulations, and an invitation to meet her at her Balmoral estate in Scotland. Thus fortified, he addressed his critics when the Savage Club honored him on Saturday, August 31st. Archly defending the RGS report from the snobbery of, quote, Mr. Fred Galton, FRS, FRGS, and God knows how many more letters to his name, he won cheers, a standing ovation, and praise for his ten tenderness toward Livingston and the playful, contemptuous satire of his detractors. But soon, even the British humor magazine called on him, in rhyme, to desist from his criticism. You, undaunted, successful, and manly, turn up your nose at all cattle and cads. Little of this news reached Clemens aboard ship, so his September 1st lectures, letter to Stanley before docking in Liverpool acknowledged only the explorer's public biography. He signed himself, your fellow Missourian, as L. Clemens, Mark Twain. But he clearly caught up with all the details by the end of the week when he defended Stanley and took down his RGS detractors in a comic speech at London's Whitefriars Club. I am very proud that it was reserved for me to find Dr. Livingston and for Mr. Stanley to get all the credit, he told the friends, in the first of three posts at the RGS, here invoking Sir Henry's armchair scoff at Stanley's claims of success. And just to remind everyone of the heroic truck 
through the jungle Twain added but I said to him it's all right I have discovered you and Stanley will be here by the four o'clock train and we'll discover you officially and then we will turn to and have a regular good time second day reminded listeners that Stanley had not only beat the RGS rescue team, but had also partnered with Livingston on geographical research, as Mark Twain archly put it. And then we surveyed all that country, from Ujiji through Unanogo and other places to Unyani Amendi. I mention these names particularly as intelligence to the Royal Geographical Society. <laughs> the last joke Effort echoed Stanley's wide, widely reported remarks to the Savage Club the week before, declaring his alliance with Stanley and affirming American preference for self-made merit over inherited status. Stanley has received a snuff box. I have received considerable snuff. He has got to write a book and gather the rest of the credit, and I am going to levy on the copyright. But seriously, I do feel that Stanley is the chief man and an illustrious one, and I do applaud him with all my heart. Whether he is an American or a Welshman by birth, or one or both, matters not to me. Reporters seem to have missed or chose to miss Mark Twain's very pointed topical humor at the scientific establishment's expense, but the friars did not. Their roars of laughter, that's a quote from the press, an immediate offer of honorary membership showed appreciation for Sam's jabs at Stanley's doubters. Stanley was not present that night, nor had he and Sam already met at the Savage Club on Tuesday, September 3rd, as Sam mistakenly wrote in 1907. But they did visit at Stanley's lodgings around the corner from Sam's at the Langham Motel soon after Stanley returned from visiting the Queen probably September 13th or 14th. Their real friendship began. By the end of October, Sam advised his wife, Olivia, we have been intimate, and I have been of assistance to him, and he has been of assistance to me. The archives don't specify what that assistance was, but we can infer that Stanley expressed gratitude for Sam's Whitefriars talk. Sam did record that Stanley had just received articles from the New York Sun contesting his claim to American identity and alleging that he'd forged the Livingston letters and may not even have met the doctor. In his journals, Clemens sympathized with Stanley's distress and noticed how the Queen's public act of respect had reversed English skepticism, another hint at the course of their conversation. A stronger base for friendship lay in the men's three common concerns. U.S. lecturing surely led the list, given Redpath's offer to manage a tour for Stanley. Sam, disappointed that patrolling Vesuvius Navy got more than he did the last year, would have urged Stanley to negotiate with competitors' fees in mind, advice that may have shaped Stanley's contract with New York talent manager Frederick Rollman, signed the next week. That contract called for up to 100 lectures at $500 each, an astonishing rate. Stanley's contract may have cemented Sam's decision not to accept lecture invitations on this trip. It certainly did spur him to tell Redpath, when I yell again for less than $500, I'll be pretty hungry. <laughs> Joint resentment over publishing John Camden Hotton's unauthorized editions the context for Mark Twain's joke to the Whitefriars about levying Stanley's copyright, also invited mutual aid. The August 30th London Daily News had announced Hutton's reprints of Stanley's Livingston dispatches and a humor anthology by delicious Artemis, that is Artemis Ward, and Mark Twain. And you can see the announcements were right on top of each other. The ad cited the controversy over, quote, the authenticity of Dr. Livingston's discovery as a reason to buy the book, all the while cutting into the market for Stanley's own account. Stanley noted that irony to the Savage Club, notwithstanding 
the doubts cast on my statements that you'll find in Mr. John Camden Hotton's advertisement. Hotton has taken advantage of my notes. Stanley's publisher thought Hotton's book such a threat that when it announced how I found Livingston the next week, it included a warning. All other works on this subject are spurious and unauthorized. For his part, Sam had visited Houghton with fun editor Tom Hood the week before, apparently to no avail. But a week after seeing Houghton, seeing Stanley, Sam borrowed Stanley's tactic. He published a blast against Houghton in The Spectator. He joked that Houghton's colophon, that is his publisher logo, should depict a man with his hand in another man's pocket. Claimed that painfully bad additional chapters constructed by John Camden Houghton in his own books were bad for readers, and asked readers to buy his books from the only publisher who paid him any royalties. If my books are to disseminate either suffering or crime among readers of our language, he closed, I would ever so much rather they did it through that house, and then I could contemplate the spectacle calmly as the dividends came in. The two men's most tantalizing likely bond, however, given Sam's plans for a book about England, is their shared experience as outsiders suddenly thrust into elite British circles. Stanley found celebrity fraught. The day after his July 28th arrival in Paris, he wrote in his journal, I get no pleasure at all in these crowds of curious callers. I have a presentiment also that with this sudden fame, the annoyances will be quite as great as any pleasure and profit. Fets in Paris with US cabinet secretaries, ministers to France and Nice, and General William Tecumseh Sturman had given way to fraught gatherings with the RGS and British Science Association, where he had met the mayor of Brighton, the exiled French emperor, and various United scientists before visiting Queen Victoria in Scotland. She pronounced him a determined, ugly little man with a strong American twang. <laughs> he surely felt a stark, not to say disorienting, contrast after three years of travel, tough travel, 15 months of it in pre-industrial Africa. Clemens, by contrast, reveled in being a Yankee in the court. After two years of professional challenges and family health problems, he socialized with gusto. He addressed the White Friars and Savage Club. He attended the installation of London sheriffs, the election, inauguration, and banquet for the new Lord Mayor of London, and a country stag hunt. He swooned over gorgeous robes of office won by the new sheriff and the great titled assemblage, and he detailed their costumes, rights, and accoutrements. The stag hunt of, quote, red-coated, pigskin-breached hunters lost its prey, but offered aesthetic pleasure. It was fine to see the 250 scour over the hills and say fields and sail over the hedges and thank fences like so many birds, he wrote during these fairways, with an appreciation like Hank Morgan's for the masses of armed British knights. Sam accepted his place in or outside the local class structures with good humor. I go to that matchless Hyde Park, he told the Savage Club, and then I start to enter it at Marble Arch and am induced to change my mind because, it turns out, Hyde Park permits nothing less aristocratic than a private carriage. But he loved when rules flexed in his favor. At the RGS banquet, finally awarding Stanley the Victoria Medal on October 21st, he ended up at the head table with the guest of honor, the RGS president, and the U.S. ambassador, because, he explained to Libby, here men are seated at tables strictly according to their rank. But as Americans have no rank, it is proper to place us either above or below the nobles. Courtesy rather forgives the nobles, so we get good seats. His sense, though, of obligations to and by guests may explain why he took such offense at Stanley's frank response to Rawlinson's gracious remarks at the award dinner. He has been honored here 
as very few strangers were ever honored in England, Sam complained. And yet he shows the meanest, ungrateful spirit and has continued to go about snarling at England and the English. Clemens credited Rawlinson with the most manly and magnificent apology that I ever listened to. He withdrew his earlier snark and then declared, Mr. Stanley's journey from Unyayembe to Ujiji will remain to all time a brilliant example of what courage and endurance could achieve when the heart was in the right place and was sustained by a high sense of loyalty and duty. But when, Stan, but when Rawlinson blamed the delayed award on the inexorable laws of habit and fashion that kept RGS members in the country all summer, Stanley replied frankly too. Naively, perhaps, but not ungratefully. And judging by the laughter and cheers in the news reports, the audience sympathized with his account of hopes for recognition planted, dashed, and revived. Why did Dr. Livingston kindle in his bosom hopes of a kind reception from the RGS, the Times narrated, unless the doctor knew what he had done better than any other man? Was Stanley worried that, was Sam worried that Stanley's lack of polish would take them both as vulgar Yankees? It seems so. Clemens' absorption of English class consciousness went beyond seating church. In letters to Livy, he swelled with pride that self-selected committees of gentlemen around England had invited him. When gentlemen condescend in this way, it means a very great deal, he explained, because, quote, an English gentleman never does a thing that may in the slightest degree detract from his dignity. Calling Stanley a foreigner who lacks a good deal of being a gentleman reveals Sam's desire for distance. So does his conclusion. I am really and truly glad this fellow is not American. He did a stupendous thing in Africa, but he will blacken his fair renown and come to be treated with contempt yet. Mark Twain never wrote his English travel book. Projecting his English experiences into fiction, including incidents with Stanley, became a way to rescue his research from this 18th 72 trip, which would affect the rest of Mark Twain's career. By September 23rd, 21st, when he had already toured Warwick Castle, the place where Mark Twain would eventually meet his Connecticut Yankee, Sam felt encouraged that his comic take on English sites and customs would enter no worn out field. I can write up some of these things in a more different way than they've been written before. But soon he realized that doing so presented greater risks to a successful writer than a novice. In mid-October, he worried to Livy, I am by long odds the most widely known and popular American author among the English, and the book will be pretty read by pretty much every Englishman. Therefore, for my own sake, it must not be a poor book. Thus, he could no longer indulge public antipathy toward monarchy, like his cynical response to learning that the Prince of Wales would recover from typhoid, become the worst king that Great Britain has ever had, and so inspire the English to revolt and form a republic. <laughs> Nor could he again mock the Albert Memorial, even as the ignorance of an American tourist who saw the prince as, quote, a happy type of the good and the kind the well-meaning, the mediocre, and the commonplace. As his November departure approached, he concluded that respect for an English hospitality would also require him to tone down his comic treatment of local types and manners. The footprints must be all covered up carefully before they see the light. Projecting his travel insights onto fiction, and then setting the narrative in the past, resolved these problems by shifting the ridicule to a less unflattering distance. He tested the tactic in the mid-1870s with an early draft of The Prince and the Pauper by moving his tale of the Prince of Wales lookalikes from the present to the 16th century. But a time travel plot that transported a modern 19th century American to 6th century Britain would cover up the footprints even more effectively 
while enabling satire and farce on both cultures. That book, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, would begin taking shape in the mid-1880s as Sam saw its potential to overcome these and other roadblocks. I couldn't get any fun out of England, he explained in 1879. What I mean is you couldn't satirize any given thing in England in any but a half-hearted way, because your conscience told you to look nearer to home, and you would find the very thing at your own door. But once you set a time to the Yankee back to the 6th century camera, his fish out of water British-American contest enabled equal opportunity satire. The combination of Stanley's pluck and self-destructiveness on display in 1872 would reappear along with his wounded self-love in Yankee Hank Morgan. But Hank's love for his adopted England matched Sam's own. It is the loveliest land in its summer garden, he gushed to Lee. I would rather live in England than America, which is treason. And even in 1872, he sensed that the British cultural continuities and disruptions that would play out in Hank's tale in what he described to his sister-in-law as all the centuries that have dragged their lagging decades over England since the heptarchy fell asunder. Mark Twain's imagination drew inspiration from fact. Real people, real places, real events, and real experiences all found their way into his writings. His comic American take on British customs stayed on hold for nearly 15 years, while fiction, starting with the Gilded Age in 1873, largely displaced travel and topical writing. But he revived the English project in earnest soon after he, he reunited with Henry Stanley in December 1886. Sam had just read three chap draft chapters of Connecticut Yankee to an audience in New York when he heard Stanley lecture in Hartford and Boston on December 8th and 9th, and hosted him for dinner and overnight on the 8th. That night, the two men, joined by Joseph Twitchell, enjoyed, quote, talk till late hour, all about his adventures on the dark cotton, according to Twitchell's diary. His style of narrative, fascinating, dramatic, entertaining, and thrilling to the last degree. The scene of them, sitting in the Hartford House Library, outside its guest room, by its mantle imported from Aiton Castle, echoes Connecticut Yankee's opening word explanation, already written, in which Hank Morgan shares his fantastic tale with Mark Twain as they drink whiskey together by the fire late at night in Warwick Castle. Stanley left the U.S. two days later, but the men corresponded for the rest of the decade as Sam sought to acquire Stanley's next book for his publishing house, Charles L. Webster. Stanley's public and private accounts of his adventures in Africa just does remain on view while Mark Twain wrote Connecticut Yankee from 1886 to 1889. And the men remained friends for the rest of their lives. Clemens named it as, quote, one of my most memorable experiences when Stanley was, quote, good enough to bring some 75 or 100 of his friends to greet me in April 1895. The dinner grew out of correspondence between the men. Stanley helped Sam plan the worldwide lecture tour that would pay off Webster Coe's debts. The men and their wives became especially close while the Clemenses lived in London in the late 1890s. When Stanley died on May 10, 1904, Sam kept the news from the ailing woman, Livy, that he grieved with the widow. I have lost a dear and honored friend, he wrote. How far he stretches across my life. It is 37 years. I have known no other friend and intimate so long, except John Hay. The next fall and winter, Mark Twain honored his friend, who helped King Leopold of Belgium found his Congo colony then being condemned for its brutality by omitting Stanley from his scathing anti-imperial satire, King Leopold's soliloquy. But that's another story. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.